Papua New Guinea, a mysterious island nation in the southwestern Pacific was cut off from the rest of the world until 500 years ago. Here, sheltered in the depths of the jungle, human beings have lived for tens of thousands of years, some maintaining their traditional way of life to this very day. Sparkling ocean, fertile land, a land of contrast, a place where old and new, traditional and modern exist in harmony. But gone are the days when the people of this land needed to hide themselves away to survive. Now they are rapidly integrating themselves with the modern world. Francis Keta. I come from Papua New Guinea. I belong to the Tolai tribe. I am 56 years old. I'm married with four kids. Maybe you can find it in the, in the map, the world map, but if you can, well, good luck. But that is where I come from. a.m. Three boats leave the shore carrying members of Francis' tribe, the Tolai. Dressed up in ceremonial costumes made of leaves, they sail out to sea, chanting blessings, embracing the dawn of another day. The Tolai people have always worshipped the sun, the bringer of light, warmth, and life. As the sky lights up, more people come out onto the beach. As the sun rises out of the water, the three boats join together and the beach turns into a carnival under the sun. This is Papua New Guinea, a country of more than 600 islands. With Indonesia to the west and Australia across the sea to the south, it's the second largest country in Oceania. On more than 400,000 square kilometers of land, over 1,000 tribes have flourished for generations. The ancestors of the people lived in relative isolation from each other. As a result, there are more than 800 different languages spoken here. In the 16th century, Portuguese and Spanish explorers first discovered the island. The Portuguese called it Papua, which means the land of people with curly hair. Because the locals looked very similar to the people of Guinea in Africa, the Spaniards called it New Guinea. In fact, evidence from modern archaeology, anthropology, and genetics shows that the Malaysian people, aboriginal to the country, indeed came from an ancient African population who migrated out of Africa and arrived at the islands here about 50,000 years ago. 
Every July, the people of Papua New Guinea hold a grand celebration, the Mask Festival. Bringing together all the tribes and traditions, it's a chance for everyone to showcase their local culture. Representing the Tolai, Chief Francis is there too. And what do you see? Behind what you see has meaning, right? And that meaning has value. The value behind what we do is you can see the tradition. Demonstrating various rituals, they show the world what Tolai culture is all about. In this one, a child crawls through an adult Tolai's legs. Thanks to this unique rite of passage, the child is born again as a full member of the tribe. Spells and incantations are another important aspect of Tolai culture, warding off evil spirits and protecting the people. But not all of their rituals are shown. Some are so important to the tribe that they must be kept secret. Uh, what you see down here is uh, our tradition. Uh, what we do is our culture. Uh, that is how we live. That is what we do. As the celebration ends, every performer is rewarded. The harder one is hit, the more appreciation he receives. What's thrown at them is a kind of currency, shells on a string. Such currency has been in constant use for thousands of years among coastal tribes like the Tolai. The length corresponds to the value. In a market today, shell money at two arms length is worth approximately two US dollars. It's amazing to think that it's still in use today. The sea has cradled many tribal cultures, but throughout the long years, the people of the inland jungles have created their own lifestyle too. Kuk Village is located in Mount Hagen, the capital of Western Highlands province. Henry Rue is the custodian of this seemingly empty plot. You cannot be able to see some evidence because uh, they are about five meters deep. The evidence is about four to five meters deep, so you cannot be able to see. But on top of here, we have, we have been allowed to make gardens on top, just to plant cellar crops, cocoa and all this. But we cannot plant trees on it because the roots might go down. Uh, five meters down, they might spoil the evidence beneath. Buried here is an archeological site showing evidence of agriculture dating back more than 7,000 years. It was excavated in the 1990s, but the site has now been backfilled for protection. The excavation found that the site used to be a swamp that covered more than 100 hectares. This was one of the earliest examples of human land reclamation. Houses that they built, and they could find the shapes when they excavated it. They could find the shapes of the houses, some the Kaukomons, and uh, some were fossils of these bananas, yams and taros, all this. The Kook site is a listed UNESCO World Heritage Site. Few sites in the world contain evidence of sustained agricultural activity from so long ago. Henry Rue lives in the neighboring village. He and his fellow villagers watch over this overgrown plot of land. It's their way of preserving and safeguarding their cultural heritage, the culmination of thousands of years of development. Kokapo is famous for its volcanoes. Papua New Guinea is located where the Pacific, the Indian Ocean, and Australian tectonic plates meet, the so-called Pacific Ring of Fire. Here, earthquakes are frequent and volcanoes are active. 
Yet, despite all the dangers, life manages to thrive here. Nighttime. A bonfire lights up the darkness. Time to meet another of Papua New Guinea's tribes, the Baini, and to witness one of their mysterious rituals. According to legend, a high-ranking tribesman once dreamt of an ancestor's face emerging from a tremendous flame. This was seen as a revelation, and the tribe's people made masks in the ancestor's likeness. The fire dance ceremony was born. Fire. The Baining people, known for their masks and fire dance, have prospered in and around Kokapo, a town located in the northeastern corner of New Britain Island, an hour's drive from the famous volcano Taverver. Some people believe that the fire dance resembles the volcano eruptions. Because if you could be here in 94 and 37, you would see how much fire comes out of these volcanoes. And uh, we believe, or some people believe, that the fire dance is symbolic of that volcano fire. And that's why it's man trying to survive fire. They're, they're jumping in the fire. In 1994 and 2005, Tavaver erupted. The eruptions destroyed the city of Rabal at the foot of the volcano, so residents were forced to move to Kokapo, located 20 kilometers away. What's left of Rabal nowadays are only ruins covered in volcanic ash. The memorial is the only building that survived. <laughs> The Baining people live in the surrounding forests of Kokapo. For the mask festival, the Bainings put on the finale. The masked dancers make their grand entrance behind the cover of woven palm shields, a symbol of their reverence to the ancestors. A two-meter-tall mask is the most striking feature of the Baining ritual. It is the most sacred mask of the tribe. So massive, it takes two to perform the ritual. Because of its immense weight and size, it needs to be stabilized on both sides with cords, making every performance highly dangerous. I'm supporting Ed Blongen, not Tupla Kapisha. And by only Molsem, I support him Ed Blongen. Because this is the first time put down, and by die. Die. The mask dancers are all strong young men. Wearing a mask this tall, even walking becomes challenging. Each mask dancer has black and white body paint, the traditional protective colors of the tribe. In many tribal cultures, women are barred from sacred ceremonies. But in the Baining tradition, the female elders may take their entrance with the dancers, while other women sing together to accompaniment of a drumbeat. Deep in the jungles of Kokapo, the tribal people perform the fire dance the most grandiose of all the ceremonies performed in honor of the ancestors. 
young men who perform as fire dancers must live in isolation for one month leading up to the ceremony as a display of piety, eating just enough to keep body and soul together. At the height of the dance, the mask symbolizing mother appears next to the fire as the singing and drumming intensifies, as if to encourage the young men to cross the sea of fire. Perhaps walking in flames perfectly epitomizes the tribe's thousands of years of survival. This is a film of supreme anthropological significance. In 1930, Australian prospectors entered the interior of the island, going into the jungles. They were amazed to find thousands of indigenous people living there. It had been 400 years since the Portuguese discovered the island and the residents along the coast had already experienced the hardships of colonialism and global warfare. It was only then that people realized that there were even more people living in the interior of the island, pursuing a lifestyle almost untouched since the Stone Age. Less than 100 years later, how different it's as if they've fast-forwarded in time for thousands of years, from the Stone Age to modern life in less than a century. In modern-day Papua New Guinea, traditional tribal culture blends seamlessly with modern life. Although you still see people making their own pots, modern cooking utensils are also in use. The clay pots fired in leaves are not only still in use as household utensils, but are also popular souvenirs for tourists. The drum is the quintessential Papuan musical instrument. Drums made from hollowed out tree trunks make the loudest and most solemn sound. There's also a smaller drum made from bamboo. The most exquisite drums are lizard skin drums. Honed to perfection by thousands of years in the jungle, the sound of these drums once meant war and battle. Nowadays, things are different. The beat of the drums usually means there are tourists around. A wedding is about to take place in Komanka village, not far from the Kuk site. Tribal villages in Papua New Guinea still enjoy a high degree of autonomy. The chiefs live among their people. And young people are free to pursue the relationships they choose. But the eventual marriage must be approved by the parents. Even in some cases, the entire community. This is my grandpa and this is my grandma. And this is one of our cousins. He's trying to introduce me to the prices here. That's a bride. That's a bride. The wedding celebrations will last all day, so the bride arrives early to help. It's our decision. It's our decision, so we just get married. Cheering women greet the guests. These are the guests of the bridegroom's family. They bring with them a variety of gifts. This is the kind of banana used exclusively for a wedding. Papua New Guinea has more than a dozen of species of bananas. Sugar canes and vegetables are essential, as well as oil crops. All of these will make up the bride price. The bride price is directly associated with respect to the bridegroom's family. This is a marriage between different tribes, so the bride price is especially important. We yeah, come from different tribes. I'm from here, and this is from uh, the side of Mondays. 
I fully believe that uh, there will be a 20 or 30 pigs, almost uh, approximately. The most precious gifts are pigs. In Papua New Guinea, pigs have a special status. Almost all tribes have a tradition of worshipping pigs. Pigs remain a symbol of wealth here. An adult fatty pig is worth 4,000 kina, or about 1,200 US dollars. In Papua New Guinea, nearly all adult men are good public speakers. Before presenting the gifts, they give a detailed account of all the good things about the bridegroom's family and convey their sincere congratulations. These days, traditional tribal outfits are reserved only for the most significant occasions. Ancestor worship is a significant aspect of most celebrations and gatherings here. Now, all the gifts are stacked together for display. Each pig has its own spot. Altogether, the bridegroom's family has gathered 32 pigs. 32 is a very respectable number of pigs. At dusk, the bride's parents lead the wedding procession. Both sides of the family will deliver important speeches during the wedding celebrations. To begin with, it seems more like a negotiation than a wedding. The two parties haggling over the bride price and the bridegroom's family insisting that she had nothing to do with her original tribe after marriage. They also spend time discussing the history of relations between the two tribes. Since this is a marriage that crosses tribal divides, it's important for both sides to think about how it affects each tribe's status and honor. The grand ceremony doesn't disappoint the guests. After three rounds of speeches, the bride's parents finally agree. In accordance to the tradition, the bride's father distributes the bride price to everyone from his tribe who comes along. It's an event that brings joy to the entire tribe. The traditions and cultures of the tribes will go on. The memory of the fire dance is still crystal clear, showing no sign of fading. In these changing times, wearing grass clothes or nothing at all might be becoming a thing of the past. But one thing's for sure, these islands will continue to be shrouded in glamour and mystery for a long time yet. And it's the best diving in the world. Yeah. A world-class diving spot. Rich fishing resources. And the islander's favorite sport, rugby. Please join us on the next stage of our journey into Papua New Guinea's modern life.